there, and welcome to the Untitled Film Podcast with Callum and Johnny. I'm Johnny. And I'm Callum. And hello to our lovely audience this week. Uh, very, yeah, a little bit late this episode, but... But these things happen. These things do happen. Life gets in the way. Um, but I am sure you will enjoy it nonetheless. Uh, it could be your alternative coronation listening tomorrow if you... Did you say nonetheless or I nevertheless? nevertheless. Oh, okay, good. It sounded like you said nonetheless. I don't think I said nonetheless. I well, didn't mean let, to say nonetheless. Let's, let's not go back. Well. I just try to find my way to interrupt. <laughs> like, try to find my spot every episode yeah. to cut your Ruining flow. my flow. Anyway. Every episode. Going back previous to that, uh, the coronation... Uh, is this weekend in Ingerland, uh, and hopefully this might be up by the time the old kingy gets crowned. Uh, and connecting the dots together, uh, we have some form of social media. We do indeed. Um, and we asked a question on said social media this week about King and Queenie. We did. Uh, so as always, um, you can follow us on uh, Instagram or Facebook under uh, Untitled Film Podcast. And we did ask a question. I'm just stalling for time while I get to our Instagram page. Very professional, Callum. <laughs> um, you have one job. Happy Coronation Month. I know it's not until the 6th, because I posted this a few days ago. Um, we're asking for favourite depictions of royalty on screen, because I wanted it to be broad, because I thought there's quite a limited scope for actual coronations. Yeah. Um, so, and it doesn't have to be real. Uh, it can be depictions of real royalty, but it can also be fictional uh, fantasy films, for example, take it. Uh, so should you use your example first, or do you want me to go ahead? Uh, I can use my example first. Uh, but I think we should... <laughs> we should uh, talk about the ones that we got posted on. Oh, um, yes. So one of them said, send this pic to at podcast underscore music underscore. And the other one says, promote it on at underscore podcast records. So thank you for those I two messages. I want all of those people to just leave us alone now. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Is there a way to block them on Instagram, I wonder? I think it wouldn't be much point in blocking individual accounts because the point is, is that they, I think the way that they get you is if you sign up for one of these deals, you have to sort of reciprocate by going on other podcasts. <laughs> so I it's think, basically it's Andrew Tate. Yeah, it's, it's that's a, how it's Andrew a Tate works, scheme. for those who don't know. It's a pyramid scheme. Oh, okay. I, th I think that's how it works. That's why they're always so random. <laughs> and that's why they never seem they never seem like bots. It's never like um, they count do seem four, like bots, six, but, nine, two. Yeah. Sometimes they seem like they actually kind of, there's a person there. I think that's how they get you. Wow. Um, anyway. Yes. That was a, on that slight tangent. Um, my, my probably favourite depiction of royalty is Olivia Coleman in The Favourite. Oh, fantastic. Um, it was a really interesting... I forget which queen it is. Shall I Google it? Uh, yes, that do, might be a good do, idea. Do, 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 in do, order to do, not make this do, man looks up something do, on the internet, do, oh, should I go do, ahead with mine? Go for it. Uh, mine isn't really a moment, it's more a trope, like uh, Disney movies. You fucking love tropes. I, I love my tropes. Tropes, tropes. I love and my the tropes. tropes, tropes. And the tropes, tropes, tropes. tropes. You there. mention tropes every single week. Well, they they are relevant every single week. But well, if you say so. It's a moment in usually fantasy films where the day is one. Uh, the, the the character who didn't realise they were a prince slash princess slash whatever the royalty is in that type of movie realises that they are and always ends with them kind of earning their way back onto the throne. So uh, I recently rewatched Stardust, which has a very good version of that, where Tristan becomes the, the king. And it's very funny because you have Robert, <laughs> Robert De Niro and his crew of pirates, Captain Shakespeare, going, ar in the background, and he, he kind of wins them on, ar And it's always really funny. I really like that kind of thing. It's just a nice way to end a fantasy kids movie. Very nice. Uh, it was Queen Anne. Lovely. And I like how it shows her kind of madness and her friendships. I like how it shows her petulance and child... child what was, it, what was it? Childish. Childishness. I was going to say childless, but I don't know if she was childless, but she was childish for sure. Um, yeah, really enjoyed that film. So that's my one. Yeah, it's really great. Excellent. I think that after you guys have paused the podcast to go onto Instagram and follow us and reply to our questions this week, brings us to the news. We're not going to continue until you do. We're not going to continue? Okay, let's continue. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. Ever. Ever. Not ever. 
can stop never give up hold your head high and reach the top something about you have got bring it all back to you bring it all back now do americans know who s club seven are i think they did have one minor hit because okay. they had that crossover TV show where they went to Miami, so that actually they, all their TV shows were abroad, though. The, the, this, yeah, they they played in America, so the, they, they, they had too, a yeah. bit of an audience okay. over there. So I think they had one sort of like top twenty. Okay, so for our American listeners, tell us what your thoughts on S Club Seven were. Yeah, please do. I'd be very curious. Um, but anyway, yeah, on to the news. And this week we have an incredibly important news story. We've decided to share. It's the first, in, first in, for everything. I know. It's so important that we've put our many differences aside and have decided to share it. Uh, writers are on strike for the first time since, I think, 2007? Yes, yes. Um, so it's the Screen Actors Guild of America, I believe. Screen Writers Guild. Screen Writers Guild. <laughs> Sorry, not actors. Oh, the Writers Guild of America, yeah. the WGA. Absolutely. Um, which is a big chunk of the writers for live action stuff. Uh, it's not the animated writers, just to put a... Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they've, so there was actually, there's been a few shows where uh, there's a Phoenix and Ferb reboot, something no one knew they needed. Actually, Phoenix and <laughs> Ferb's all right, but anyway. Um, they're doing a Phoenix and Ferb reboot, and they are... I've just started work on it, and they were posting, oh, first day back in the thing and everyone's going bloody scabs and stuff but no the animation guild is not um it's not striking as of yet although actually animators are probably worse paid and worse treated than uh even the normal writers but callum can you tell us why are they striking what are the kind of bullet points so there's a few various things firstly it's um the the that's writing has become a um um kind of very day by day it's uh, become a freelance sort of gig um they're turning it into a gig economy um and it's not one big reason as to why but there's several little reasons so for streaming television um uh, shows don't get to that magic syndication point so a tv show that might get to 20 or 30 episodes roughly two or three seasons it never gets to the point where their writers start getting contracted to earn sort of monthly wagely uh, salaries uh, writers rooms are closing up um, they're getting smaller and smaller and they're the the smaller that they get the less that they get paid because again um, non-syndicated television like well, like Netflix all the streaming services kind of have mini writers rooms with the idea that uh, you write ideas for episodes or potential episodes or future episodes for a show that doesn't yet exist and will pay you a lot less but of course you know people want to get paid to write so they kind of don't fight it or mm. haven't historically haven't been fighting it so those are two uh things and it it also because shows aren't getting syndicated like um, each season having 24 episodes or 22 episodes writers aren't earning monthly salaries in the way that they used to like even before syndication where they would show up to work for something like six months in a year uh, because they would go to like shows that are still existing. Like uh, I think the last one is something like the Goldbergs, which I, I should, that may have just ended actually. Um, that would have had like a, a monthly paycheck writer's room because of the way that a 24 episode per season thing, but now it doesn't <laughs> stop throwing things at me. Um, and there's also the fi very real fear of uh, AI at the moment. It is a hypothetical, a hypothetical fear that um, AI might replace writers. At the moment, it's not nearly good enough to come up with kind of fully formed scripts that are coherent. But it is a very real fear that they don't want to lose their jobs in the future to AI. So I think those are the major ones. Did I miss anything? Yeah, I mean, I don't think so. I think I think what I want to maybe drill down into a bit is my understanding is it's a lot to do with how streamers have really, which is kind of what you mentioned, but how streamers have really changed the industry in the last few years um, and how they kind of don't really respect writers in the way. Writing after the kind of last kind of crisis actually had almost a bit of a golden age because you had what, HBO having really good quality TV and AMC coming on the scene with good quality TV. And when the streamers first came out and it was, you know, it was all like House of Cards and Orange is the New Black and all these really high quality shows. Yes. And they followed a much more kind of standard model. But then when there's now so much content and actually everyone's trying to cut back. And also I think one of the things that I've seen is people saying COVID had a big 
impact as well and really change the, the job and, and change the, the way the writer's rooms work where there's a lot less kind of bounding around of ideas and a lot less kind of camaraderie. Uh, um, and actually, I mean, we've kind of mentioned it off air and on air a little bit. We, I don't think feel the quality of stuff that started to come out in the last two or three years post COVID is is to quite the you know existing shows like Succession and things. Yeah, fair enough. But I don't think that I can think of many new Halo shows apart from maybe some HBO stuff that's come out in the last two three years that's that good. Even everything that I kind of see that is like half good i've just watched like the diplomat which is reasonable so it's not a bad thing doesn't have that level of quality to it and i think actually this probably connects a lot to to what's happening on two levels so i think the quality has dropped and what they've done is one of the reasons the quality has dropped the writers rooms have shrunk like you say they do these mini rooms first so you'll have the showrunner and maybe one other writer they'll basically flesh out all the ideas for the season and actually possibly even write the first two or three scripts and then on top of that, the seasons are 10 episodes long. It used to be 23, 24 episodes long. So they bring the writers in for three months. Then most streaming shows get, what, three or four seasons. That's 30, 40 episodes. So they never get any residuals money. So they don't have the money to plug the gaps anymore. They're having much shorter seasons. Um, and although there is, you know, a lot more shows going on. That's the ironic thing, is that yeah. ironically, there's a lot more work. It's peak peak <laughs> output, but but they're expecting people to do a lot more work in a lot shorter space of time. So you, the people have to pick up two or three shows. And obviously that doesn't always happen. You know, things don't get picked up or, or whatever. And it's leaving a lot of people in the lurch. Yeah, okay, you get on a good show. It gets multiple seasons. You can you get fill-in work and whatever. Those people do okay. But you get on a show, it gets cancelled after a season. You know, when you don't have that... You might have had, you know, before, if you'd worked for six months on that show, you might have... Ten thousand dollars in the bank or whatever, but now there's not people don't have that reserve, so it's really pushing a lot of people out of it. And apparently, there's a lot of people leaving writing at the moment to go and work in, you know, advertising or you know wherever else sure. writers go to. So it's it's having a really negative impact. And I think as viewers, we need to support the writers a because people should have a you know a good source of income but b because i think it's really personally think it's really impacting in the quality of writing oh, on shows it absolutely is and and a point that needs to be brought up is, is burnout like mm -hmm. if, if writers are chasing jobs which they <coughs> didn't have to if they had some relative comfort even for a show that had maybe got cancelled after one season but that season lasted for six months and it paid you quite well for the time that you were on it now if they're chasing jobs and they have to do two or three jobs at any one time quality is dropping because mm -hmm. talented writers are stretching themselves too thin in order to make ends meet well the sh or, or the showrunners are writing half the show by themselves and then yeah as you say the kind of the, the the quality is not you know they might have written the first and the last episode before and they've had really talented writers yeah. to write the other eight or 12 or whatever episodes. What happens, like usually a creator will be responsible for the first last and then they'll get to pick mm. oh i want to do that favorite episode in in the middle of the season oh i'm yeah. really looking forward to doing that one but you guys fight over the rest and you guys has anyone got this is my idea for the season but have you got any better ideas and, yeah. and if you're if you're coming up with all the ideas and all of the treatments and writing three of the episodes before you have even bought the writer's room together and then the writer's room's half as big i mean don't get me wrong sometimes having too many cooks isn't a good thing but there's a reason that you normally have writer's rooms because people can see when there's a poor episode or there's not enough jokes or there's a glaring hole in something and i just yeah i don't think i just don't feel like the quality is there at the moment on on tv shows and i you know i think you can and really new tell movies too um mm. like it, it does stretch to features as well we spoke a lot about the um uh, effect on television but on movies it's having exactly the same effect that they're expected to write a lot shorter time frame for some piece of shit that comes mm. out on netflix in like the middle of the month that no one cares about but i, th I think that's the problem and it, it's you know it's, it's not just streaming it's been a squeeze that's been happening for a long time you, you got this situation where with movies you had tentpole movies and you had three million dollar movies and there was nothing in the middle for ages mm -hmm. and actually streaming almost bought that stuff in the middle back but the streamers want to play that safe that stuff in the middle so safe they want to be like okay we're good it's going to be every single one of our movies on Netflix will have Kevin Hart and we'll have either Ryan Reynolds or The Rock with Kevin Hart and then it's going to be a spy movie or it's going to be this or that and it'll be the most formulaic thing ever and it's going to be written to... So the whole point, you know, you used to get 40, 50, 60 million dollar movies or 100 million dollar action movies that maybe 
did something a bit weird. You know, quite often, the, like in the mid '90s, all those weird Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. That yeah, very kind high of, concept yeah, movies exactly. that, that of star vehicles, <laughs> which maybe didn't. You know, they usually had reasonable budgets, but they might have not had the same budget as a Top Gun or something would have had. Um, and you've just lost a lot of that stuff. You've lost, and and then you've got the kind of everyone just wants to re- for the tent poles wants to recycle existing IPs. So Marvel movie seven hundred and ninety three, even though they're already starting to and even diminish non, returns uh, on Marvel those now. movies. I mean, look at uh, uh, something like Ghosted that just mm-hmm. came out on I think Apple TV with Chris Evans. Apparently, basically half the MCU cast shows up. <laughs> And it's this idea, like, you know, everybody's having a lark. There are so many cameos in these movies because everybody's just bereft of ideas. Or everyone, like, you're Disney, you're like, we'll just make a live action of everything that was successful for us in the 90s. And occasionally Disney puts out, like, a quite a good sort of YA mm. film. That There's a film um, about an Asian kid who uh, decides to play basketball. I can't remember what it's called, but I was surprised to see, like, 75 on Metacritic. It's like, oh... I should check that out at some point. That looks quite interesting. But it's been completely buried. Mm. Like you wouldn't know about it if, if I didn't tell you. And I couldn't even remember the name. No, because they you know, promote whatever the newest Marvel one that was in the cinema for two months and now they've done with it in the cinema so they're going to whack it on plus. Absolutely. So yeah, everything's a bit... Uh, I think with the streamers, they need to... You know, if they're trying to cut budgets, they need to concentrate on quality. Oh, absolutely. E- either absolutely. quality or mass appeal which to an extent that's what they're doing with the movies by putting kevin hart but, but, but that is again always diminishing returns because the first couple people were like oh my god they've got adam sandler they've got kevin hart they've got you know the rock but then the, when the fourth one comes out it, you notice it goes to like number one for a couple of days and then it starts qu- pretty quickly sliding quickly along slips away mm-hmm. whereas when thing like good quality stuff used to come out when you know the uh, you know even like wednesday or something like that come out you used to see it stick at the top for like two weeks and yeah. things so i think they need to try and you know either concentrate on mass appeal or con- uh, well, probably do a bit of both have a bit of mass appeal and have a bit of like halo shows that get them the oscars and things which they can put on the posters and and not what well, actually they seem to be concentrating on the minute was this really mid stuff that's kind of like well that act is successful that formula successful we'll use the same sets and camera we use in everything and everything looks like a homogenous blob yeah, which is kind of across all streams just feels beige. Like that. yeah yeah anyway we slightly went off topic there but that is our <laughs> our rant over about the writer strike support the writers support the writers viva la revolution exactly uh Anyway, um, what is your second piece of news, Callum? Well, this is kind of one of those bits of news I actually don't care about the film that is attached to it. But every so often there's an actor that you like who isn't a studio favourite actor necessarily that they get regular work, but every so often they'll get a job in something that you know is going to pay their bills for some time. Kind of in a way, kind of hinting what we were talking about before, they might actually uh, be allowed to stay and work in Hollywood for a bit longer. And you go, oh, good. Film sounds like a piece of shit, but I like you. So the Welsh actor, Jon Grufford, uh, who in the early to mid 2000s was threatening to be- kind of break into the B list, and it kind of just never happened, as is often the case, is going to play a villainous role, as yet undisclosed, in the next Bad Boys film. And I absolutely couldn't care less about the film. I didn't know they were going to the Bad Boys film. <laughs> well, is that don't... Michael Bay going back to. I don't think well it's Michael Bay. I think he's, he's just got a producer credit. Like, um, But Will Smith and Martin Lawrence are in it. He did three, though, didn't he? No. Did he not? No, no, he didn't. Um, what but does he do now then? Other than I think he's just shit he's, out of Transformers he's movie at the age after. where he can just kind of get a customary producer credit for not doing anything, you know. So it's probably what he's doing. Same with the Transformers films. But I couldn't care less about the film. I just it's just one of those cases where you're reading a bit of entertainment news and you go, oh, good, that'll probably be half a million dollars. Oh, good for you, mate. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah, and that's it. But I just uh, it's something a bit nice after the heaviness. Yeah, that's fair. Um. I have a slight, yeah, also maybe a little bit lighter news. Um, so you, Apple TV Plus, one of the only streamers that is concentrating on quality, in my opinion, um, is doing a movie with Brad Pitt about Formula One. Oh, yes, I've heard about which this. Which is also one of my other interests, that Lewis Hamilton, seven-time Formula One world champion, uh, is going to be involved as a producer. Um, now, what's slightly strange about it, in my opinion, is that Brad Pitt is playing a Formula One driver, and Brad Pitt is, checks notes, in his 50s, I think. Yes, he is. Um, 
So the oldest Formula One driver, and people keep telling him he's too old, although he's still right, is Fernando Alonso, who was also rumoured to be dating Taylor Smith recently, um, randomly. Uh, but anyway, um, he is 41. So that's kind of weird. But yeah, apparently it's going to be a story about him and a young hotshot coming up, th- him helping the young hotshot through the ranks or something similar to that, which sounds like the plot of every movie to do with racing ever made. Um, but anyway... I digress. Uh, what was been announced in the last few days is that Brad Pitt is actually going to drive a modified F- F2 car, but basically a very fast race car at um, <clears throat> at the British Grand Prix. Now, not in the Grand Prix itself, because that would be mad and dangerous. Although that was how some of the... It was reported initially, and everyone was like, what is he, are they fucking talking about? Um, but he's going to drive the car between sessions, Um around the track so you can get the crowd shots and things so i thought that was quite an impressive um you know attention to detail obviously the last time there was something like that was rush um which i actually really like i think it's a good film overall um and they really struggled i think to get those things to get the crowd scenes and things and there's there's one or two of them where they've they've you know got a big crowd in but it never seemed like quite enough people and then what they've managed to do obviously if you're going to drive at the British Grand Prix there's 130,000 people there so it will look really cinematic I think so yeah I think that's quite an interesting piece of news yeah it's always nice when they try to do things for real yeah absolutely excellent well I think that wraps up the news an extra long episode of the news today but an important one but an important one to be talked about and on to our movies one of which is an important one that needs to be talked about, <laughs> and one less so. <laughs> Very much so. You'll find out what we think of them both. So, Callum, what are our movies this week? Well, we're doing animated films, and I think we're going to switch up a little bit on how we pick our movies, because I think before we were starting to feel a bit of burnout after the Cinema Paradiso episode and uh, struggling to find, like, oh, we have to find a film that's about nostalgic cinema, and, like tying ourselves so rigidly to a theme. That we've start- and also, uh, this film has to have just come out on streaming service. I think now we're going to be a bit looser. So it's still going to be a new and an old. But uh, the new may have come <laughs> out. I think this, it's almost a year old by now, um, this film. Because uh, Mark Kermo's review of it was 10 months ago. Although that is still within it's our still limit. Within our we limits. always said we wanted to try and do the new movie within 12 months. But, but we're, we're not going we, to struggle yeah. so hard to kind of fit. for. And so I think we said within ideally within one year and older than 10 yeah. was our rule. But yeah, we're just going to do whatever we want now. We are going to be doing whatever we want. And linking them rather than going, oh, theme, it must be, it must be this theme that we're linking. Thinking, right, so in this time, we're just, oh, two animated movies. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about two animated films. So they are Minions, Rise of Gru, the uh, sequel to the prequel, and um, Lilo and Stitch. So yeah, those are our two films. So we'll kick us off with uh, Minions, Rise of Gru. Who, who wants to take this plot? Go on then. Go on? Okay. I'll do it. <laughs> it's the, what plot there is. <laughs> well, it, yeah. So is, has anyone listening to the podcast seen Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog? I have. Yeah, exactly. I think most people our age probably have. Uh, it was like one of the first big things on the internet. Well, the first 20 minutes of the movie is basically Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. So there is this group of bad guys called the Vicious Six, and they decide that they're going to get this amulet. This bit's not that Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, but they're going to get this amulet that does something, but that you find out later in the movie what it does. Um that they can then use on Chinese New Year. And they send in their old boss, played by, um, I was going to say Alan Alder, it's not Alan Alder, it's... The other Alan, uh, yeah, the other old Alan. Uh, Alan... Arkin. Arkin, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, played by Alan Arkin, and then they double-cross him, because they don't need him anymore. And you think of him as dead. Cut to young Gru being mildly naughty as opposed to being evil because he's too young to be evil. Young people can't be evil. We can't see this, but I'm wobbling my hands side to <laughs> side. Um, and uh, yeah, he anyway decides that he wants to join the Vicious Six and sends his CV in to the Vicious Six. And as it happens, there's an opening because they killed off their old boss. So he toddles along, the most excited he's ever been, with his minions in tow, and goes for a job interview. And they laugh him out of the room because of his age, ageism. And he's going to teach them a lesson. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Callum, what did you think? To steal a parlance from you, it's all right. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to be slightly more moderate than Johnny will be because I already know his opinion. Um, and I think from that fairly sarcastic plot summary, uh, I think you can <laughs> tell what he's going to feel. I, uh, firstly, I think it depends on how much of a stomach you have for slapstick. And if you, if you like slapstick, you'll like bits of this, I think. If you... <laughs> If you don't, then you're not going to. Um, That's a slide whistle, by the way. I think that the, the issue with this movie is the rise of Gru parts. I mean, it's just the plot, really, to string along the interconnected minion sketches. And I think in individual bursts, those minion sketches, if you are a fan of um, a slapstick comedy, actually, are, they're all right. They're, I mean, they're not nothing... Uh, groundbreaking it's not a Jacques Tati or, or Buster Keaton but you know as it goes it, I've seen worse I've certainly seen a lot worse which is very much damning with faint praise <laughs> um, the problem is, is that I think slapstick has a ceiling for me like I can watch a 15 minute Mr Bean sketch or I can watch a 30 minute episode of Bottom with Rick Mail hitting um, Eddie in the head with a, a cricket bat um, and after half an hour, I'm like, okay, I'll watch something else. The problem is that this is a 90-minute movie. So what it tends to be, this is the structure. Set up a plot bit with Gru. Then Gru goes away for a bit in order to move the minions one step closer to the next goal. And each goal has an individual slapstick sequence, which in individually would be a quite a good short film like if i was watching uh the next illumination film like i haven't seen mario yet so i don't know if there's a short film before it but if i was watching an illumination film and they played a short film um with the minions doing any one of these sketches i'd say yeah that's pretty good problem is is that it's five five or six of those strung together into a movie so you know individually they're quite funny like uh three minions interrogating another one and out of nowhere, one of them just brings in a, a baseball bat. I, I did find myself chuckling to that. Or running up a hill. Oh, sorry, running down a hill and realizing they're a lot slower because they're being chased by some bad guys. And they go, and they realize, hang on, we're pill shaped. We can just lie down. And then they start rolling. So there's some clever individual bits. It's not a movie. It's six short films that have the worst stringing along. The Gru stuff is kind of not even really worth talking about. It's just, it's not terrible. It's just functional but in the most bland nondescript way so the good bits are not good enough to sustain a 90 minute narrative i would much rather be watching a 10 minute sketch before mario or something like that so it's, it's not a movie but what about you johnny i think you're going to be less kind to me and i wasn't particularly kind i, I genuinely thought it was quite boring okay um and i shall expand on that boring is not a very good word um but it 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 did just I I don't find slapstick probably maybe as funny as you do. I find it funny at times if it's done well. Um, but I just, overall, I just think it's the lowest form of comedy. Um, <laughs> and I don't think the Minions are particularly good at it. And I think the problem is I've seen their shtick in, what's this, like the fifth movie? I think so, yes. Because there's three Despicable Me's and then now this is the second yeah. Minions film. So I'm just bored of them. Like you say, the Gru plot is so nothing. And oh my God, how annoying is Steve Carell's voice as young <laughs> Gru? Like, it's so annoying. Now, I think it's supposed to be, and I heard him say this, a impression of Bela Lugosi. Yeah, I, I, I think. But, but then a young version of that. And, now, and it's been pitched. I up. don't mind it as much as the uh, when he's older. I don't like the pitched up one. It, again, it's one of those things, if it was in a short film for two minutes, you wouldn't think about it. But over the course of forty an hour and 40 minutes, or however long the film is, an hour and 30 minutes, it just grates on me. Um, I laughed, Belly laughed, I think, once, and I maybe snorted or chuckled two or three times. But that's about it, which is not enough for a comedy movie, in my opinion. Doesn't look that good. The visual jokes aren't that stunning. The whole, I didn't, don't think the character design's particularly interesting. And that's the thing, I, I, I know people that have seen it and went and took their kids and stuff to see it and they were like, oh, I liked all the 70s and 80s references. But I thought most, apart from the Michelle Yeoh bit, there's a, there's a kind of a kung fu sequence bit. Kind of. She's sort of like, uh, at one point, the minions come to her, her for help and she's like, um, becomes their mentor for yeah. a scene. That I kind of like. That was probably the one bit I kind of liked. But outside of that, it, uh, it wasn't much that really 
was that excited about. And then the ending just sort of happened and it wasn't, it was very anticlimactic. So there just wasn't that much about it that I liked. Do I think if you put some kids in front of it for, you know, who who just want something to have on in the background, then it would work and would, would sustain their attention for 90 minutes? Absolutely. You know, it's fart jokes and things like that. I'm sure, you know, that's fine for them. But it just isn't enough to sustain me. And, and I I think the thing is, we've been spoilt with the quality of animation in the last, well, forever really, actually. There's always, you know, if you go back to oh, the yeah, old Disney course. stuff, the you know, it was good for both adults and kids. It was There was jokes for the adults, there was jokes for the kids, there was jokes for everyone, the stories were good, blah, blah, blah. And I just think this is just such a cynical, lazy money grab. And it could have been so much better. And the earlier, like the first Despicable Me, I don't think it's a masterpiece. A lot of people really love it, but it's it's good, you know. And the storyline's basic but endearing. The minions are in, in smaller doses, and they're funnier for that, I think. Yes. Um, and it and it works, and and then everything. And I, actually, I quite liked the first Minions movie, despite. I think it's certainly better. Yeah, I think, and, I think uh, the fact that they're not don't have um, Steve Carell doing his thing, and the plot is the Minions. Yeah, so and they've actually it. come up with a half. It's not like a masterpiece of a plot, oh, no, but like no. a half the you know a reasonable plot. And I kind of thought um, Kirsten Wig is Kirsten Wig, isn't it? Yeah, he's the bad. Oh, actually, no, I don't think it is. I think Kirsten Wig plays Steve Carell's girlfriend in. That's it. I think it's Sandra Bullock. Yeah, Sandra Bullock. I, uh, I liked Sandra Bullock in it. Um, I thought she was. Um, I thought she was quite funny and, and stuff. So again, that worked better for me. And this is just such a level of diminishing returns that I just didn't find it funny. So I didn't find it funny. I didn't find it endearing. I didn't really like the animation. I thought it didn't think the story was great. I thought overall boring. And so that's my review. So. What, what a wasted <laughs> cast as well, because they've got a very imaginative yeah. and interesting left field cast. They got the RZA in there. They got oh, Michelle Yeoh, as you said. They got. Jean Claude Van Damme and Dolph Lundgren mm. and Danny Trejo, like you know, that's a third of the Expendables basically. And then they just give them a line each, and it's like, well, why bother mm. getting those people? Like, they're not even famous enough to put on the poster. They're the kinds of people that you hire because, oh, I'd really like to work with Jean Claude Van Damme. Yeah, yeah. That's a life goal of mine. And, and they then you get them for a day. And some of them get like maybe seven words. Yeah. It's literally like it's almost like. I I've got crabs for him. I don't remember Ooh. anything that um, Dolph Lundgren said. Or John called Van Damme. Yeah, it's like uh, just him eat chuckling evilly. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. And that's it. Uh, yeah, oh, it was, what an easy paycheck for them. What a strange you know, waste of a cast. But I imagine it was probably more the directors going, you know who I'd like to meet? Let's make an excuse to cast this person. I think mm -hmm. that's probably more it, the fanboy sort of thing. It, it, Illumination is so weird for me because they always make loads of money. They always spend very little money on the films. They obviously have a very good marketing team and they're always just so mid. They're always just so, at best, 7 out of 10. So like. I think there's a psychological reason why the Minions work so well and it's um, been known in comic books for a while, but the more you draw a person to look like a person, mm. the weirder it looks. But yeah, it's uncanny valley. Yeah, so if you make the simplest nothing design for a character, the more, uh, especially in this case, kids can go, oh, I identify with that. But that's fine, but then that's not what they do in all their movies, and all their movies are wild. I mean, look how much money Super Mario's made, which, again, I'm sure is perfectly serviceable. It's probably maybe as good as the first Despicable Me, but he doesn't get quite as good reviews as that, but it's probably in that realm. But it's... You know, what 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 an unfair world that that makes. I also think the um, simpler they make movies, the more child-friendly well, they yeah. are. And whereas Disney and Pixar are sometimes yeah, a bit but, too complex. But adults love them. Like, think about how often there's, like, a picture of a minion next to, oh, like, a cup of tea in the morning. On, like, posted by it's a 50 year old woman on Facebook. It's a wine mum sort of thing. It's like <laughs> mum's net. You know, mum's net is crawling with two things, minions and transphobia. Yeah. Um, yes. So, yeah, it's... I just, I don't get it. I think I mean, that's it. I do not get I'm it. I'm a little bit more charitable, but even I'm sort of, you know, I'm, you know, very mild in my moments of praise. And even that was like, it's mostly rubbish, but there's a few good bits. But it's a weird one because like, <laughs> even people like, like Mark Commode loves the Minions. And Mark, loves it. But then Mark Commode loves Mamma Mia. Uh, and he also <laughs> loves uh, Slapstick, I think. Yeah, uh, I he think. does. I think the thing is with him, he's very... 
Um, he quite likes simple plots. He quite likes simple things. Yeah. He he's a simple man at heart. And he's quite <laughs> apart from when it comes to horror. Well, yes, and he's quite sincere yeah. in a lot of ways. So I think. Hang on, I'm sincere, and I think there's no sincerity about this I, I, movie. What I was going to say is that the reason why him, unless unlike the wine mums like like it, is different to why one audience likes it to the other. He mm. he likes it for the pure joy of slapstick, whereas they like using minions because it's a meme to use. Because mm. they're meant to be cheeky. Yeah, exactly. I'm being a cheeky. Anyway, uh, unless you've got any more to say no, on it, I think no, that probably I, I think, uh, we've, uh, wraps that, that, one, that up. one up. Well... It's time for an advertisement break. Welcome back from the advertisement break. I like break. this jingle. <laughs> Callum's not going to say anything about Ironically, I'm wearing um, buying it. Um, a Robocop t-shirt. OCP is the no. evil corporation. But not that you, any of you at, at home would know that. No. No. Not unless you take a photo of it and put it on Instagram. I'm sure I will. Uh, anyway. Uh, we are back, and now we are going to talk about Lilo and Stitch. Take it away. So this film came out in 2002. It's just as, after the uh, Disney Renaissance was wrapping up. So this was in their next period where they were trying to do slightly more boy-friendly uh, animation for a while, have more uh, less onus on uh, romantic relationships and uh, musical numbers. And it was started doing things like a bit wackier. So Lilo and Stitch is probably the crown jewel of that era. And uh, it concerns the plot. There's an alien planet, uh, a e doctor, an evil doctor, uh, has been um, convicted by the Galactic Federation um, of illegally genetically modifying this creature into existence, which is hell-bent on evil and nothing else. Uh, this is what will come to be known as Stitch, little blue alien with uh, six limbs. And it's, it's, it's something six, five, experiment yeah, six, five, uh, eight. I, I can't remember exactly what they call it, but it's like it's something like uh, experiment. Six, two, six. Yes. And um, they realise how dangerous it is, so uh, they exile it to... Um, uh, the planet earth with the thinking of uh it can't survive in water uh, and this planet is so, something like 70 percent water but it just happens to hit the tiny island of hawaii and uh, you know it, and long kind of millions of one shot it hits hawaii and it's there where a um quite a lonely and slightly troubled uh, preteen girl Lilo uh, she's having trouble her sister is kind of essentially her mother because their parents died so her sister has to do the job of both being a big sister and a guardian and that's tearing their relationship apart somewhat and it's making things frustrating um, they're under a very antagonistic glare of a social support worker named Mr. Bubbles played by um Ving Rames, a very scary looking guy. He's got something he's got first name Cobra. Cobra, <laughs> Cobra, Cobra Bubbles. Bubbles. I, bubbles. Uh, oh Bubbles, yes. And um written on his fingers is something like uh, it says um I can't remember exactly what it is, hatred on your hand or something like that. And is she's very much at the risk of being taken away and taken to social services and um you know her, 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 the uh, bigger sister just can't uh take care of this girl anymore she can't figure out how to do it be it both a mom and a sister and it's then when they make the decision well why not let's get you a dog maybe that will calm things down and because leela uh, sorry because stitch by all intents and purposes looks kind of dog like it gets taken to the pound and it's there where they pick up Stitch and this little hellraiser of an alien starts raising hell again in the small home of this very troubled um, family unit and all that implies. So, Johnny, what did you think of Lilo and Stitch? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really like Lilo and Stitch. I've always really liked Lilo and Stitch. Um, I remember watching it when it came out in the cinema. Uh, which was many moons ago. Um, what year did it? 2002. 2002. So I would have been at the grand old age of 12. Um, it's very heartwarming. Great story. Um, I, I really, really like the characterizations of all the characters. I think um, the, I think it has a, a really good arc, really good character growth. Um, I think it's very touching. I like the the whole world of Hawaii that they create and also the kind of the world of these weird interloping um, tourists that you just get these little shots of like dropping their ice cream and things 
Um, I like what they did with Lilo as a character. I think she is incredibly likable. She's got, she has issues, and I think we can all see ourselves in her to an extent. I like the character arc and the character development of Stitch. I like the animation. I like the style of Stitch and things. I think, again, this is where something like Illumination is really poor in comparison. Stitch is quite a simple... When he puts all his alien bits away and he looks more dog-like, he's quite a simple design. He's not anything too complicated. But I think he he looks endearing. He can get a lot of emotion and things out of him. There's not much you can do... Because, again, he's quite slapstick in his kind of movements and Oh, there's a lot of slapstick in yeah. this movie. Um, but he, his face and everything is so expressive, so much more than with the minions. The minions, their mouth moves. That's about it. Like, there's not much more to them than that. Um, and again, actually, there's a lot of that kind of like almost miming. He doesn't, he says the occasional word here and there, which is kind of what the minions do. But again, I find him far funnier. Um, but yeah, and and it, and again, I, I know it's the old film where we can tell the ending, but if you haven't seen it, I don't really want to spoil the ending for you. Um, I also like the little details, like the fact that Lilo is obsessed with Elvis and that has some really good little moments around her being depressed and lying down, listening to Elvis by herself and all these little things that just like such great characterizations that again, you see that there's a meme these days and things on the internet. And I think that tells a story of how endearing it was. It was a period when um, the kind of Disney renaissance was over and this is probably the last really good movie that came out of them for quite a long time. Yes. Um, you could argue it's probably... The be- I can't, you know, hand-drawn animation. There's been a couple of good CGI films, but hand-drawn animation was probably the last really, really good one they did. You, you could say Princess and the Frog is okay, but I, I think I would put this above Princess and yeah, the Frog. Yeah, me too, I would. Um, and then previous to that, it was, you know, there was a lot of missteps around that time. Uh, Emperor's New Grieve, I've always got a massive soft spot for. But other than that, <clears throat> it was probably one of the, the two really good movies that came out in that kind of late Renaissance Absolutely. period. Absolutely. No, um, I, yeah, I definitely agree with that. So no, I love it. No, uh, yeah. How about I, mean, you? I, I, I adore <laughs> this film. I adore this film. And it's, it's a smart movie. It's a very ahead of its time because this was in a period where during that late, uh, I, I guess we're calling that period the late Disney Renaissance. Yeah, Everything yeah. Everything 2000 to about 2009. Because there, there was already at that point a couple of wobbles. Yeah, there were. Movies. Like A Brother Bear was the year after this yeah. and that's it's not, okay it's okay Too and uh, um, from my life, treasure right? planets and stuff like that yeah. uh all of which is not terrible <laughs> home watchable on the range <laughs> yeah home on the range atlantis you know all of these films they're, they're fine they but this is the crown jewel really of that moment it's a very ahead of its time because of course now disney is very conscious about um trying to fairly portray other cultures um it's hinted at although not explicitly said that uh, lilo is neurodivergent and it's not something where it batters you over the head with it it's more a case of if you know you'll get something extra out of this if you don't there's nothing else lost from not knowing um same with how uh, they treat hawaiian culture because uh, like going on a little bit of a tangent brother bear which is about first nations people uh, in canada at one point has this kind of throat singing and you think, oh, that must be First Nations. Oh, they must have tracked down. And in the behind the scenes documentary, no, nah, it's Norwegian. We just thought it sounded cool, which is such the kind of old school Disney thinking mm. of like, we don't actually care about these cultures. Fuck them. Um, we only care what looks cool. Like with this film, they research in Hawaii for a long time. It's one of the first instances of um, a certain type of Hawaiian music uh, in a mainstream film because Hawaiian has, of course, had their own cinema and culture. Um, the way it treats the tourists as, like you, as Johnny said, interlopers, almost alien-like themselves. Yeah. And Lilo has a fascination with taking pictures of them. And like, aren't they beautiful? As if they're, as if they're the uh, yeah, foreign they're like animal. Creature. They're the zoo animals. Yeah. But yet, the, the it's a two-way street because, of course, those white tourists are gawping, uh, you know, gawping and and laughing. Yeah, at, and at Nanny and, yeah, and, Nanny, and Dave. Is it Dave? Dave, Dave? Yeah. So Dave's kind of love interest of Nanny, and they both work in the tourist industry. Like he's a, a fire spinner and and uh, yeah, I think all in the Hawaiian, Hawaiian kind of skirts, and those, hula so. skirts and, and grass skirts and things like that. So it. It treats its culture with sensitivity that wouldn't be seen again until the late 2010s. And uh, it treats uh, neurodivergent relationships with sensitivity that, again, wouldn't be seen probably again until about the 2010s. And it's very moving. It's incredibly moving, actually. They they really work out this whole thing about this uh, 
broken family about the parents and who have died. Ohana. Oh, and the whole, Ohana means family. Uh, just And there are moments in this film that utterly gut me. Mm. And I do mean gut me. This is one of my big tearjerker films. Like, um, one moment I don't mind spoiling a little bit because it doesn't give away the ending is when Nani thinks that she's going to lose Lilo to the social worker. She sings um, Aloha Oi, uh, which is a song, I believe, written by the last monarch of Hawaii before it was annexed to America. Okay, yeah, yeah. And it was. so it has cultural significance, but it also has, has significance that she's going to lose her sister just as um, she lost the people of Hawaii. And again, if you don't know, you don't lose anything. It's still a very moving moment. But if you do know, that moment is so culturally rich. And it is a case of like, we often say, oh, white people should, shouldn't really write it. Like with the Sam Mendes review a couple of weeks ago, um, they shouldn't write about black stories if they're not going to put in the work. Well, this is how you put in the work. Mm. You know, these writers, they research, research and research. And then beyond all the kind of thinky stuff and the soapbox stuff, it's just a very funny film, a lot of slapstick, a lot of good one-liners, like uh, one particular slapstick moment where a volleyball uh, gets thrown at uh, Stitch and hits him on the head a bit, and it's quite soft. And says, a little buddy, throw it back. And so he just punts it at this guy's face. And, and it's like, that's funny. That's just plain good comedy. And we haven't mentioned the aliens much. Um, the aliens come back to try and retrieve uh, Stitch. They're probably the weakest part of the film, honestly. Um, it's more traditional Disney stuff, but they're also occasionally funny. They're passingly amusing. One of them is the kid, uh, one of the members of the kids in the hall, cult Canadian um, sketch comedy. So there's fun to be had there, even if that's kind of the least interesting part of the film. But no, I got nothing but time for this movie. It was a wonderful film. Love it. Love every piece of it. Yeah, no, I think you made some good points there as well. Um, no, I, I don't think there's there's much wrong with it, really. I think if I had one criticism, because I feel like this is a film podcast and we should try and In criticize the, things, uh, I do uh, think fairness. maybe it takes a little bit too long into its runtime to maybe get going. Or get into the Hawaii stuff. Yeah, I think uh, when I was watching it the day, I think it's the first time that Stitch and Lilo meet is about 25 minutes in, which is quite a long time for, I feel like, a, an animated to be Family honest, movie? I find the alien stuff, it's fine. It's, yeah. it's functional. And you kind of need it to get the story going. You probably could have taken five minutes of it out, I, maybe. I think it's the least interesting part. Yeah. And even when they're on Earth trying to recapture Stitch, it's like, oh, they're funny enough. Mm, it's the family stuff. But they're, the, they're not yeah. as interesting. No, absolutely. Um, it's actually, it's also very interesting that for a film of that period, um, it is still has, and particularly actually in Asia, has a, it's still incredibly popular. It's still popular here. You still some, you see Stitch toys and you see things about. But actually, both Japan and China have their own Stitch TV series. Oh, so wow. Japan has an anime series and China has a Chinese animated series. And the Chinese version, um, there's a, I think it might be in the, the anime one as well, but certainly in the Chinese version, there's a pink Stitch that has a, like, his, his love interest. Um, shall we say <laughs> that's what aliens have um, and honestly like the amount of kids that I would see in well I used to live in China for those that don't know when I used to live in China the amount of kids that I would see with the pink stitch and in Thailand as well and, and in Asia so still really big over there it's one of they had quite a lot of when I went to Disneyland um, in Shanghai they had a lot of stitch stuff um, and I still, yeah, as I say, like I still think it's reasonably popular here, certainly for that period. Like I don't think you're not going to be finding Home on the Range toys or Atlantis toys and things when you go to yeah. the parks. It's still one of the, you know, the ones that's kept in, um, you know, higher esteem. Uh, and yeah, I, I, you know, so I think that is a, I think that showing how it shows how indeed it got to people, and you know, I think people really still see this film with, you know, th through. With a really positive yes. framework. And I think uh, a character like Stitch, in the same way that Mr. Bean travels or the minions actually travel, is that it's mostly, they speak slapstick. the most slapstick yeah, and absolutely. they don't say much. So no. it's, it's easy to translate them overseas mm -hmm. in many different, and it's quite simple design. And the as words well. that they do say, it's like hi yes. and things, which, you know, everyone knows that. So yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that is another reason why it's so endearing actually and people in asia quite like cute fluffy things as well so he can be quite a cute fluffy cute toy and fluffy yeah well if you say so well, that's the line in the film i know it's <laughs> the line in the film. so yeah i do really like him okay. i think that 
probably wraps up both I of our reviews so. today. Yeah, I think so. So I think Callum, what did you think of Minions 2, The Rise of Gru? Passable in moments, um, which is really is sort of like really faint praise. I mean, in, in bursts, it can be quite funny. It just takes... Uh, the plot just takes a lot for granted from that and even when it is momentarily funny it overstays its welcome by quite a lot so uh, between four and five but i think probably closer to a four uh because you know that that means there's a few chuckles here and there and a few good slapstick moments but can't give it any higher really i think basically the way i see it is from an adult point of view it's and I don't like using the boring word again because it doesn't give you enough adjectives and things, but I do think it's just boring. I don't think it is a film that parents are going to get really excited to watch while they're watching with their kids. But do I think, which is one of the main purposes of this film, if you put a five-year-old and a six-year-old in front of it for 90 minutes... Or Mark Kermode. Or Mark Kermode. <laughs> um, you can make whatever joke you want from that. Um then they'll be pleasantly entertained. And that means it's probably done its job in, in you know, in its kind of core job. Totally. But I just think it could be better quite easily. Um, so again, yeah, I think four or five, so I'm going to give it a four as well. I think that's a fair score. Yeah. Because I think, I think so. it, you know, it does what it probably needs to do on the tin. But what's in the tin is hot dogs and not. Yeah, it's, know, it's not gourmet. No, exactly. exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's passable. Yeah. Excellent. And Lilo. And Stitch. It was just wonderful. I mean, there is a minor flaw of that. The aliens are less interesting and maybe, it, yeah, it does take a, a bit to get going. But the stuff that's good is great. Like, near Disney best. It's the best movie of that post period. It could have quite easily been, if it was made in 97 or 96, it would have easily fit among the Renaissance of, amongst any of their... Uh, well, no, probably their best. I, th- I ra- ra- rate it very highly. Um, I think I'm probably a 9 out of 10, losing only a small point uh, because the, the alien stuff is amusing but functional. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think my, like I said, I think my biggest issue with it is I think it gets takes too long to get going, which is also because of the alien stuff. But other than that, it's pretty perfect. love the character design. Um, love the story, love the arc, love the emotionalness of it, love the use of the Elvis music. Yeah, just really love it as a film. So I think I will also give it a nine. Yeah. Very in agreement here. <laughs> yeah. Does that always happen? <laughs> no, it doesn't. So, um, yeah, I think to sum up, if you've got some Bambinos that you want to put in front of some colours, Minions 2, Rise of Gru, A-OK, otherwise probably we'd give it a miss. And if you haven't seen Lilo and Stitch, go and watch it. And if you have seen Lilo and Stitch, go and watch it again. If you want to have a private cry or a sob. <laughs> oh, <it> means family. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and on that cheery note, have a lovely coronation weekend and bye. Later. <laughs>